And as we watch the sea and the waves of the political world rage and roar, we take comfort in the words of Amos chapter 2 and verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And it is with this prophetic light that shineth in a dark place, as Peter called it, that we look to the so-called Arab Spring in our first session together. We want to consider the words of uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. And so we see as we look out there in the world around us, this troubled sea of nations, these words coming to pass, that there is a work being worked, and God has told us before these things. The trial for us, though, is to believe what he has to say, and to watch with the eye of faith, and to convert the, the faith that we get through seeing these things into actions and the things that we do. And so as we consider what's been going on in the Middle East in the last little while, there has been many events of great significance. The Economist warned in July of 2010 of the changes that were coming to the Western world. Following this, there was the overthrow of the government in Tunisia. And then there was Egypt rising up, and what was termed the Arab Awakening. Now the reality of all of these things is that while it is termed the Arab Spring, really what it is is a world fraught with revolution. And these activities that we are watching right now is a changeover that is taking place. And the issue that is at hand really is the, the preparation of the nations. We have to stand back from the sandstorm that's been going on and all the media hype that surrounds it and consider where things will end up. We know the, at the latter days, we're told in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 13, that a company, a great company, is going to be gathered together. A great company that will come against the land and the people of Israel. And we're told in greater detail in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 9 that thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Well, this invasion is described in great detail in the books of Daniel and the books of Ezekiel, the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel, and the northern host, the confederacy of Gog that is described in Ezekiel, two great power blocks that will fight over the Middle East in the latter days. And what we're seeing in the world around us is the events that are taking place that lead up to that point. The gathering of the nations, as you go through the prophecies, is something that is talked about by all those prophets dealing with the latter days. We read in Joel chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2, Behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and parted my land. So this pinpoints the time period, just like Ezekiel did. It is the latter years, the time when Israel is brought back from the sword and gathered out of many people, when Jerusalem and Judah, the captivity of them, is brought again, this great gathering of nations will take place. And we live on the very knife edge of that period of time. Further on in Joel chapter 3 and at verse 12, we read that let the heathen, the nations, be wakened to come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, where there will be multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, or concision, or threshing, as the margin has it. For the day of the Lord is near in the, in the valley of decision. And of course, that great conflagration is described in the book of Revelation. It's referred to by the Lord Jesus Christ as Armageddon. In Revelation chapter 16, and at verse 16, the final gathering of these nations together is into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And that's the, the end picture of what we're seeing right now. But as we look at that, we have to sort of unravel it to a degree. Because the sixth vial that we've read about in Revelation chapter 16 is a chain reaction of events that culminates with this gathering of the nations together for this battle, Armageddon, the heap of sheaves in the valley for thrashing. Open your Bible, if you would, to the reading that we had read together in, in uh, Revelation chapter 16, because we'd like to consider this chain of events. We read in verse 12 that the first event in this chain reaction is to be the drying up of the river Euphrates. 
And so there is this great river, it describes it as the river Euphrates, and the water thereof is dried up, but the way of the kings of the east, or the kings of the sun's rising, might be prepared. So the first event in this chain, of, or chain reaction is this drying up of the river Euphrates. And this is in preparation for the kings of the sun's rising, setting the stage in the land for the kings of the sun's rising. Following that then, we read that there is, or simultaneously there is going on, the frog spirits that are, that are going out into the world in verse 13. I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world, and their purpose is to gather them to the uh, battle of the great day of God Almighty. So that's the next thing in this chain of events. And we're going to spend some time talking about those frog spirits. This is followed by the thief-like coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that is sandwiched in between the period of gathering and the actual battle of Armageddon itself, which of course finishes off this chain reaction. So let's come for a few minutes and consider this idea of the drying up of the great river Euphrates, the first in this chain of events. Because it has to do with the Middle East and the Islamic powers that are there today. We read that it's the great river Euphrates and the water thereof is dried up. Well, we need to put this really into context. You read in Revelation 16 of the drying up of the river Euphrates. And if you were to just sort of ask the question, well, what does that mean? Without putting it into the context of the rest of Revelation, all kinds of different ideas could be presented. But if you come back to Revelation further uh, into chapter 9, going back a little bit to the period of the trumpets, we find that the sixth trumpet sounded, and there was a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So before the Euphrates is dried up, it overflows its banks back in the period of the trumpets in Revelation chapter 9. Now this is an entirely another subject that we could consider, and obviously we don't have the time to do that today. But just as a, a brief summary of it, when we consider the great uh, overflowing of the river Euphrates, the four powers, or the four angels that are identified, were the Seljuk Turks, beginning with Togrul Beg at around 1038 to 10, or 1295, followed by Genghis Khan and the Mongols, and then we had uh, Timurlane and the Mughals, as they were called, or Timur as he's sometimes referred to. And finally, there was the uh, Ottoman Turks under Muhammad II around the year 1402 uh, to 1453. And that's really the area we want to focus in on because it was during this period of time that out of the mouth of these, these creatures as they're described in Revelation 9 came out fire and brimstone. And of course, this was the fire of the cannons that were introduced into the area at the time, and with which Muhammad II was able to siege and successfully take uh, the Byzantine Empire. Because that's what these uh, four angels are really targeted upon. The Byzantine Empire, the eastern side of the Roman Empire, which was, of course, the area um, that uh, encompassed, encompassed the area of Palestine, as it had become called. Now, Muhammad II, of course, established the Ottoman Turk Empire, which was to spread right the way across into Europe, uh, throughout Turkey as it's known today, but also down through the land of Israel, uh, down into Saudi Arabia, Egypt, across Lebanon, um, sorry, across Libya, um, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, right the way almost to the Straits of Gibraltar. So all the area that is affected by the Arab Spring of today was encompassed in this area of the Ottoman Turk Empire. Now, Bible students reading those things and considering what was going on at the time recognized that if the loosing of the four powers of the river Euphrates was the coming into the land of Israel and into the Middle East of these powers who crossed over the river Euphrates coming from further east and inhabited that area and took it over and ruled it, then the drying up of the river Euphrates that's referred to during the period of the sixth vial must be the removal of these powers. And so it was that hundreds of years ago, writers identified this. 
Recently, we came across this book called uh, Knowledge of the Times. It's, it's referred to in Alpha Israel, or sorry, in Eureka. And actually, Brother Thomas quotes um, Eliot, who is quoting this book. Well, we actually found a copy of this book. And this is what was written in 1654. So this is 357 years ago, or 263 years before the Ottoman Empire came to an end in 1917. And the writer, a man named John Tillinghast, said, We are to understand the Ottoman family, or the Turkish Empire, called the Great River, because of the multitude of people and nations therein. Rivers signify people and nations, and the waters thereof were dried up. The Turks' power and the multitude through the pouring out of this vial shall be wasted and destroyed. So reading this, 263 years before the events happened, he was able to correctly identify that the drying up of the river Euphrates would mean that the Turkish Empire would have to come to an end. Of course, we're more familiar with Brother Thomas's words in Elpis Israel, where he writes, the water of the great river Euphrates, uh, in like manner, represents the military power of the Ottoman Empire, which is dissipated by a process of evaporation, a drying up, a gradual uh, exhaustion, so as at last to leave the channel of the river in the heart of the great city empty, and devoid of all power to impede or interfere with operations developing in the southeastern recesses of the empire. The military and political power of the Ottoman Empire was to be dried up by the wrath of the Sixth File, that the way for a certain class of kings might be cleared of all hindrances and impediments to their enterprise in its beginning. And so there Brother Thomas, picking up on these things, recognized that what would have to happen is that this empire would have to be done away with, so that the events that we read of in the book Elpis Israel, the hope of Israel, that he correctly predicted, would in fact take place. And brothers and sisters, our community was thrilled and their hearts were excited in years gone by at prophecy days of, of many, many years ago without all the, the fancy stuff we have today, but just Bible open and newspaper in hand where it was read that these great events were taking place. In World War I, Turkey sided with the German and Austrian powers and became the enemy of Britain and the, uh, the uh, Tarshish powers, up until which point in time they had been on somewhat friendly trading terms. And to open the second front and break the stalemate in World War I, remember they were all in trenches and trench warfare, it went on for years and years and they just couldn't seem to get anywhere with it. So Churchill had the idea of opening a second front. He was the first Lord of the Admiralty at the time. And they decided they would go into Gallipoli and the, the Dardanelles and the whole area of Turkey, which was a complete disaster. So having failed there, they tried another direction, and that was to come up through Palestine. And of course, this is uh, Colonel Lawrence, known as Lawrence of Arabia, who led part of the con uh, conglomeration of Allied forces he led the Arab powers, Faisal of uh, Arabia and others. And of course, into that, it was the time period when Jerusalem, just before it was taken, the British government released the Balfour Declaration and the com committing Britain to the establishment in Palestine of a national homeland for the Jewish people. And having made that commitment, it would only be a month later when General Allenby would actually walk into Jerusalem and the Euphrates was dried up the power to impede the developments that would happen in the south would be removed. And so those are the events that lead up or begin this chain reaction of the uh, sixth vial. The power was removed to prepare the way for the kings of the sun's rising. Now that wasn't all though, because not only was there to be a preparation to take place, um, but it was for the kings of the sun's rising for the kingdom of God that would come upon the earth. And of course, um, that was to include the restoration of the Jews to the land. Um, the same writer from uh, 357 years ago wrote that the Jews, who upon the pouring forth of this vial, shall return to their own land and eventually, although he doesn't quite make the distinction, be converted to Christ. I take it that the pouring out of this vial prepares the way for both. That is, the possession of their own land, again, and their conversion to the faith of the gospel. 
the scriptures being full and clear that in this, that when the nation shall be converted, they shall be in possession of their land again. So he does have it correct that in order for them to be converted, they must first be in the land. And so he looked forward some 357 years ago and said, when the Ottomans are removed, then there has to be a coming of the Jews back into that land. And Brother Thomas, of course, commenting on this said, there is then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation of Jesus Christ, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in the kingdom. So that was the hope of Israel. That was the hope of our community that we sing about in song or hymns such as O More Me for Zion, written before the events that we see in the Middle East had taken place, written with the eye of faith, confident that what God had said, he was able to perform. And so that's what our brethren and sisters of a age gone by looked for and hoped for. And of course, the whole community was absolutely thrilled and excited in 1948 when the biblical prophecies came to pass and the state of Israel was born. So those are the preparations, or just a brief look, for the rising of the sons of the, uh, of the kingdom age. But as part of this chain reaction and grouped in with it, the six vile period, there are the frog spirits that would go out and their purpose would be to gather the nations. These three unclean spirits like frogs that would come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Well, we'd like to spend a couple of minutes just considering these frog spirits, because these are the agents at work in bringing about the sixth vial and bringing about the um, great battle of Armageddon, the gathering of the nations. Well, what is this idea of a frog spirit? Well, the word spirit, if we were to look it up in a concordance, is the word pneuma. And of course, the idea is of the breath of nostrils or the mouth. And in order for somebody to speak, they have to have breath. They have to breathe in. And it's the breathing out that gives them the vocal cord or give the vocal cords the, the wind to make the noise. And so this idea of a spirit is that also, of, as is listed in point five there, the rational spirit, the power by which the human being feels, thinks, and decides, and then verbalizes what is said. And when we look at it in a biblical context, that makes perfect sense. If we come to the first letter of John, chapter 4 and verse 1, we're told not to believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So the idea then of a spirit is that of teaching, something that basically would be, be going out into the world. In this case, he says that there's false prophets that have gone out into the world. Revelation talks about these frog spirits that would go out into the world. We read that they were spirits of demons, spirits of devils. Well, the word there is a uh, demon, a god or a goddess, an inferior deity, whether good or bad, an evil spirit. And of course, the world goes all over the place with this idea of, of demons. But of course, we also know, when we just look simply at our arrested scriptures, our brother Ron Abel put together, Isaiah 45, verse 1, there is no other power other than God. I am the Lord, there is none else, there is no God beside me, Isaiah 45, verse 5. And when we look at this idea of spirits, or demons, in the way that it is described here, the, um, the, doc, the uh, daemon, or the demon, when the Lord Jesus Christ dealt with legion, in Mark chapter 5, and at verse 15, we read, they come to Jesus, and they see him that was possessed with the devil, the demon, and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. So when we think of a demon then, it's something that has to do with madness, crazy ideas. This man was possessed with demons, running around naked amongst the tombs, but once the Lord Jesus Christ healed him, he's found in his right mind. So when we look at that, brothers and sisters, and we realize that these are doctrines or teachings of demons, they're teachings that are mad. 
but they're going to go out and, and sort of bring the whole world down into the Middle East. And it's this kind of wisdom that is fleshly wisdom. James describes it this way in James chapter 3 and verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, or demoniacal. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So this idea, this wisdom, this teaching of these demons is earthly and it's sensual. And it has confusion. And the word there means tumult, instability, disorder, or disturbance. That's what the teachings of men bring about. Earthly wisdom and madness, which causes instability, tumult, and disorder. And it's not of God, it is of men. So there's the spirits, or the teachings, that are devilish or demoniacal. But they're related to the frogs. So say, well, in scripture, what does that frog represent? Now, like anything, you go to the first places where it's used to find out what it's referring to. And the first use of the word frogs really comes during Israel's sojourn in Egypt, when the ten plagues came upon Egypt. And it's the first time that Pharaoh promised to let God's people go. He says, take away the frogs in Exodus chapter 8 verse 8, and I will let the people go. Now there's a promise of liberty, but of course we know it was a lie. It's a false promise of liberty. Frogs also represented corruption, because when we read of this account in the Psalms, Psalm 78 and verse 45, he sent diverse sorts of flies among them which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed, and the margin has corrupted them. So frogs are tied to the false sense of liberty and also corruption. And we think of the words of Peter which tie these two ideas together. He says, when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh and through much wantonness those that were clean escaped from whom they live, or from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought into bondage. So this idea of false liberty, the promise of liberty, is tied in with becoming servants of corruption. And it takes our minds right back to Genesis. Right back to the time when the servant made a promise of false liberty and equality and brotherhood to, to uh, Eve. But it brought about corruption and enslavement. The other interesting thing about frogs is they affect the highest levels. Psalm 105 and verse 30 tells us that their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. And so it was that those plagues went right to the top and they affected the leadership of Egypt at that time. Now there is a nation who is associated with this idea of freedom and ties to it the symbol of the frog, or has tied to it the symbol of the frog. And that is the French. Uh, the Franks, as they used to be called. And when you look up that word Frank in the dictionary, you find out that its idea it really means free in various applications. The older definitions from 1470 is free and born in a free city. In 1538, desirous of liberty. So that was the idea of the Franks. They were called freemen. And so when they chose to um, represent themselves, we have mascots today. Canada's mascot is a beaver, a rodent. You've got to wonder about that one. I guess it chops down trees. Maybe that makes sense. But, um, but the French at this point in time tied themselves to the symbol of the frog. And so we had the, uh, the different um, frogs there. You can see the fleur-de-lis in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. But the frogs up at the top on their banners, that was the symbol that they chose to use. And of course, the famous shield of Clovis. Uh, these are tapestries from uh, Reims. But these frogs, it says, would affect the king's palaces. And so when we look in history, we find that there were indeed frogs in France, in the chambers of their kings. And this is how this whole event began to take place. This idea of false liberty. And so when we consider what happened in France around the year 1789, it began with a popular uprising similar to what we've seen in the Middle East. The storming of the Bastille, where the people just had had enough of the tyranny of the rulers. And so they stormed the prisons and they let go of the prisoners. 
And under the cry of liberty, equality, fraternity, um, or liberty, egality, and uh, fraternity, they set forth a great revolution that would go across all of Europe. It was the people's revolt against the rulers. And it affected the kings of the day. And it was a great reign of terror that followed. A man named Robespierre, who sat upon the uh, Committee of Public Safety, a re revolutionary tribunal. And what it brought was blood right the way across Europe. They removed heads of state. They actually had a very sort of good way of doing it, and that was they had this device called the guillotine that physically would remove the heads from the king. Robespierre himself actually became a victim of this, this great revolution. So it was a call of liberty, equality, fraternity. Throw off the great shackles of the power, and in its place we can rule together. Everybody can be equal. Well, that idea spread right the way across Europe and removed most of the crown heads over a period of time. And in Russia, it was in 1917 that the frogs made their way into the chambers of the kings here. This is the throne room in Russia, and the frogs would come there as well in the Russian Revolution. It was a little behind the rest of Europe, but the cry of liberty, equality, and fraternity made it there. Perhaps phrased a little differently in the Russian Revolution. Instead of equality, it was communism, everybody having everything equally. Fraternity, they called each other comrades, and the idea was to liberate themselves from the power and tyranny of the Tsars or the Caesars. And truly, it, it came as a result of the violent oppression and the terrible situation that the, the Russian people were under. And the same result was that the royal heads were uh, taken away, they were removed. Tsar Nicholas and his family, all of them, were executed. And the idealistic revolutionaries who promised liberty, there was Lenin, but there was also this young man, Stalin, he became the great dictator, Joseph Stalin. Promising liberty, being a servant of corruption, brought this nation into bondage. And so were there were the terrible gulags and the great purges, where millions upon millions of Russian citizens, estimated around 30 million, the entire population just about of Canada, were put to death during this period of time. Well, this is what frog spirits do. This is how they behave. They are promising liberty, they're promising equality and fraternity and brotherhood, and what they bring about is death and tyranny. But certainly lots of change as well. So when we consider the role of the frog spirits, its goal or its objective is to gather the nations. And the preparation that's taking place is for, they're tied into that preparation of the kings of the sun's rising. So what we've been witnessing over the last little while has been frogs in the deserts of the Middle East. When you consider the word of God, this is the events that would uh, lead up to this, we've been seeing these frogs like a plague run across the Middle East. And the things that took place in Europe 100 and 200 years ago are now being reproduced throughout Egypt and other nations like it. Just consider this, the Egyptian Revolution, as it's called, all power to the people, a popular uprising. And notice the, the clenched fists and the, the sign of victory. On the right-hand side, there are two posters taken from 1917 and the Russian or the Soviet Revolution, the Communist Revolution. You can see the similarities between the two of them. So these great storms of change have been coming into the Middle East. They began, of course, in Tunisia when the uh, individual burned himself and sparked a whole revolution in that country against the tyranny of their rulers. It spread very quickly into Egypt, where in Tunisia the leader fled. Uh, in Egypt, the leader is currently on trial. It then moved into Libya, which of course we're very familiar with the news of the last few days, where the leader was executed, similar to those of days gone by. And this great spirit of frogs has spread, it's running rampant through Syria and Yemen. And also there are protests in Iraq and Algeria and Morocco and Jordan and Iran. There has been uprisings as well in just about throughout the whole northern area of the Middle Eastern or African continent and uh, the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. 
In fact, it's captured in the cartoonists of the news. Winds of change in Morocco, clouds of suspicion in Algiers, raining bombs in Libya, hail of bullets in Syria, storm of protest in Amman, hot tempers flaring in Yemen, cold hearts prevailing in Oman, uh, partly Sunni in Bahrain. This is the, uh, the weather forecast for the Middle East. But it, what is remarkable about this, brothers and sisters, is how that just so quickly it spreads throughout the whole area. There doesn't seem to be any nation in this area that isn't um, sort of uh, falling into this, except, of course, for Israel, which has been democratic all along. And probably a little overly simplistic is the idea that, you know, democracy in the Arab Spring is going to replace the intifadas and the al-Qaeda suicide bombers and so on. But we do know that eventually what has to come around in this region is a period of peace and safety. But in the meantime, as this one artist depicted it, the Arab Spring is ejecting the rulers of the Middle East from their thrones. And when you consider how rapidly this has taken place, these are just some of the faces of the Arab Spring, and we've had very quickly the removal of some of these people. In Tunisia, the presidents Ben Ali, in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, and uh, Bashar al-Assad is still sort of hanging on in Syria, but it doesn't look overly good for him at this point in time. But when you look at this, people talk in terms of, well, it's, it's it's a revival of the Arab people. It's a revival of the culture of Islam. It's the coming back of this great sort of empire, not necessarily empire, but this culture that has taken place. The reality is, it is revolution. This is a writer, um, a man named uh, Rami Khoury, who says basically fascinating aspect of the wave of citizens' revolts that are toppling, challenging, or reforming regimes across the Arab world is that people are using different words that describe this phenomenon. And he makes this big argument about how that the word Arab Spring shouldn't be used. And he goes on to say, when I ask people how they refer to their own political actions, their answer is almost universal. Revolution. So this isn't some awakening or revival or sort of coming alive. Rather, it is revolution. But notice his word there, it's a reforming of regimes across the Arab world. What is taking place, brothers and sisters, as we look at this, is the frog spirits are at work in changing the players in the Middle East. So that the the finger of God is moving these nations into position. And we know what that position is. We've been given the picture. The tapestry has already been painted for us of how it's going to look at the end. The exact road between point A and point B, we don't know. What will happen in all these nations, we can't predict exactly. But what we do know is this. It's going to end up looking somewhat like this. There is going to be a group of a southern confederacy made up of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Yemen, Jordan, and the different nations of that southern area described in the book of Ezekiel of Sheba, Dedan, who ally themselves with the merchants of Tarshish. Daniel 11 describes that there would be Jordan, the area of Jordan, which is Moab and Ammon, Edom, sorry, Moab, Ammon, the chief of that area, would basically be uh, aside from what's going on here. And on the other side of the coin, there is the northern confederacy who has its southern allies, Uh, Ancient Libya, Persia as it's called in Ezekiel, Ethiopia, Syria, Iraq, Iran, um, which are called by, uh, um, sorry, Libya is Libya, Persia is Iran, and uh, Ethiopia is with them. These nations are allied with Russia. They march with him. They walk at his steps. It says it both in in, uh, Ezekiel and in Daniel. And it's very ironic when you look at who they are, Syria, Iraq, and Iran would be answering to the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver of the image of Daniel, which we know is going to be destroyed by the the little rock, the stone that comes, the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Ancient Libya, though, was of course part of the Roman Empire. It was the breadbasket of Rome, and Tunisia, the area up to to the north, and Carthage and so on, was the area that supplied Rome with its bread uh, during the whole time of the Roman Empire. So these nations, along with ancient Ethiopia, which would encompass the area of Sudan as well, are to be allied with Russia. That's the end picture. And what we're seeing right now is a changing of events to bring these things about. 
There is hooks that are put in the jaws of Go to bring him down, as is described by Ezekiel 38, verse 4. And the hooks are told to us. It's against my people, Israel, says God, in Ezekiel 38, 16. Verse 8, it's against the mountains of Israel. Uh, Zechariah 14, verse 2, it's against Jerusalem. They come to divide the land, Joel chapter 3 and verse 2. Elsewhere it talks about the holy places being taken. They come to take a great spoil. But Revelation adds the fact that one of the gathering pieces, one of the, the hooks that brings the nations down into the land, are those frog spirits of liberty, equality, and fraternity. So how is it that out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the false prophet, and out of the mouth of the beast, that somehow the nations of the Middle East are going to be realigned to come against Israel, those that are dictated to us that will. Well, just consider this idea of out of the mouth of the false prophet. Revelation 16, verse 13, tells us that one of the places that this cry of liberty, equality, fraternity is going to come from is the false prophet who, of course, we identify with the Vatican City and the Pope in Rome. It's ironic, brothers and sisters, that it was in October of last year, before the Arab Spring really began, that there was a special synod held in the Vatican. And a synod is a gathering of bishops, a gathering of the rulers of the Catholic Church, both East and West, Greek, uh, Orthodox, and so on, uh, would all come together to the Vatican City. And they're going to talk about this, this great conference, what they can do to deal with the situation in the Middle East. Now notice, this is the Catholic reporter, thinking of the whole idea of frog spirits, what they do, what has happened in the Middle East in the meantime, Listen to the words here of the Pope. The Synod opens with a call for religious freedom for all in the Middle East. Vatican City, in the face of tension and violence, the Middle Eastern Christians must work to defend freedom, democracy, peace, and human rights of each and every individual, said leaders of the Synod of Bishops for the Middle East. So this is the picture. This was the impetus of this meeting. Freedom has to be in the Middle East. The Pope himself had this to say. It says that he sketched a picture of a positive secularism for the Middle East. So here are the frog spirits are here as well. Positive secularism, premised on justice, peace, and respect for human rights of all peoples and religion. Living in a dignified manner in one's own country is above all a fundamental human right. So the problem was that some of the Catholics and Christians of the Middle Eastern area were somewhat being oppressed by the Muslim rulers. So the idea was, well, we need to get this message of freedom and liberty out to the peoples of the Middle East. And it just happens to be that right following, shortly after the synod, after the bishops return home and send their messengers out, what we find is a great cry going through the Middle East of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And when you think about it, that is the cry of the sixth vial. It was to affect the area of the Middle East, the drying up of the river Euphrates. And whereas traditionally we've seen how that the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, have brought about great changes in Europe, and how they have secularized some of these countries and given them the, the false promise of freedom and liberty, clearing the way for the European Union to take place. At the same time now in the Middle East, we have this great cry going out. And it began at the Vatican with a call for freedom in the Middle East. But how is this frog spirit going to gather the nations to Armageddon? Well, we have to listen carefully, brothers and sisters, to the croaking that's going on. Because at this synod, there was a man named Cyril Bustros, who was an archbishop, and he was head of the synod committee. And this is what he had to say during this meeting. For Christians, one can no longer talk of the land promised to the Jewish people. This promise was nullified by Christ. There is no longer a favored people, a chosen people. All men and women of every country have become the chosen people. Now we refer to that, brothers and sisters, as replacement theology. 
And it's right in our statement of faith, in doctrines to be rejected, the doctrine that the church is the kingdom of God, because that is the teaching of Rome itself. That is the teaching of the Pope, who proclaimed in his great uh, catechism that the mission of the church is to proclaim and establish among all peoples the kingdom of Christ and of God. She is on earth the seed and the beginning of that kingdom. She is called to announce and establish that kingdom. She is the kingdom of Christ already present in mystery. And so this bishop says the Jews really have no part in it anymore. Uh, they have been replaced by Christianity. That is the call of these fraud spirits, along with liberty, equality, and fraternity. And in fact, it certainly hit the radar of the nation of Israel when the Israeli deputy foreign minister, Danny Aguilon, uh, complained that it had turned, the synod had turned into a forum for political attacks on Israel in the best history of Arab propaganda. And he talks about supersessionism, meaning that the coming of Christ cancelled God's covenant with the nation of Israel. And this isn't just some uh, nutjob bishop kind of off to the side spouting off his own opinions. This idea goes right to the very top of the Catholic Church. The Pope, in his statement to the bishops at the Synod, said, Salvation is universal but it passes through a specific historical mediation. Originally, it was the mediation of the people of Israel, which goes on to become that of Jesus Christ and the church. So the church now is the median through which salvation comes, and Israel has nothing to do with it. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said? Salvation is of the Jews. And though the Nazis tried to sort of eradicate the Jews, and, and had big posters saying, Jews not welcome in Europe, there was one poster uh, that was right underneath a picture of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross saying, Jews not welcome. And they forget that Jesus Christ is a Jew, the son of David, the king of Israel. A completely incongruous idea with what the Bible and the hope of Israel is all about. And so it is, brethren and sisters, that we live in the time of that sixth Bible. And these chains of events, these fraud spirits, as they work throughout the Middle East... We see them on the news, we hear about them, we see the terrible effects that they have and take place. The removing of one rulership for another. There's the great promise of liberty and many people get caught up in it and think, oh, things will be fantastic. Well, go back and ask the Russians from the 1930s how communism worked for many of them. Or the French, immediately after the French Revolution, where hundreds and thousands lost their lives. There's a great period of turmoil that's coming upon the Middle East as these things work their way through. Lots of discontent and lots of uh, fear as to what's going to come in place. You take away a person like Gaddafi, as bad and as evil as he was, what comes up in his place? And that's what we wait to see. But what we do know is that end result. And that is that the Lord Jesus Christ and the prophets have painted for us the tapestry of what it will be like in those latter days. But what we do have to remember, brothers and sisters, is that while these frog spirits are working to change the players in the Middle East, to paint the picture described by the Bible, the event that we need to be more aware of than anything else, more than glued to our television sets, we need to be glued to this Bible. Because it is our hope. It is what gives us the hope of Israel, the return of Christ, and the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Because tied into that series of chain events, chain reactions, is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15, we read, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. So as a community, we need to be aware of these false teachings of liberty. They promise liberty, but they bring people under the servitude of corruption. We do not need to become swallowed up by the, the spirit of the French Revolution and humanism and the socialisms and all the isms that go through. We need to remain separate from all of that, recognizing that we don't look forward to a democracy. We look forward to a theocracy. When God puts his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on this earth, and all nations are told, told to bow before him, to kiss the son, lest he perish from the way. 
And the great exhortation in us, brothers and sisters, is that this is upon us. It's at the door. There is time no longer. And so what we have to do is prepare ourselves. While the nations are being prepared, Gog is being prepared, prepare ourselves and our families. Have a little revolution in our own lives to put out all the influences of the world and get rid of them, to cleanse our houses and to be about his business. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he will have found us, not awakened in the sense that the, thing, the world thinks of being awakened, but awakened to righteousness, having our houses in order and preparing for our Lord's coming. Because he will come, brothers and sisters, before the next event in that chain reaction, before the battle of Armageddon, as a thief. But he doesn't need to come to us as a thief. But we are not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. We are the children of light. And so what we have to do is put on that armor of light and walk in his ways and his paths. And may that day be soon.